Dr. Monroe, I know you've given much thought over the years to a range of social issues and crime in particular. I'd like to know, we would like to know, what specific proposals have you formulated to approach, or rather to uh, address this national problem of murder, particularly, but crime in general in Jamaica? Bob, let's start with where we are now, the national crisis. In the parish of St. James, which has 188,000 persons, in 2017, there were 335 murders. That's far in excess of New York, with 8 million plus people. Hence, starting where we are now, this is an emergency, and therefore the government was quite correct informally declaring a state of public emergency. Having done that, what is needed immediately to cauterize the situation? As you know, you can't have surgery before you stop the bleeding. And St. James and Jamaica were bleeding. To cauterize the situation, first of all, the persons being detained, the detentions have to be intelligence driven. Spear fishing, not net fishing. And when you detain them, they need to be treated as decent human beings. Secondly, having detained them, you have to be sure that you put your best investigators to transform intelligence into evidence that can be brought before a court of law and those guilty properly punished. That's very important. Because in the 2010 state of emergency, which for four years broke the back of homicides in Jamaica and more serious crimes, or other serious crimes as well, we weren't able to sustain that, largely because so many of the hundreds of persons detained, we did not have the evidence to prosecute them successfully and to incarcerate them where the evidence are justified. Thirdly, once you bring the persons before the courts with evidence and convict them, they need to be given exemplary sentences. An example has got to be set for others who have similar mind, and you're not going to be picking up individuals only, you have to get the gangs as a whole, because 60 odd percent of the homicides are gang related and are gang driven. So that immediate clutch of proposals has to do with the current situation and the importance of ensuring that the opportunity presented by this adversity and reflected in the state of public emergency does not go to waste. Let's remember, after 2010, we were averaging uh, 1,100 homicides per year. In the four years prior to 2010, it was 1,500. So, by simple arithmetic, the impact in those four years of that state of public emergency would have probably saved the lives of 2,000 Jamaicans. We want that to happen again. We want this event to be life-saving, but we want it to be sustained in breaking the, gang, the back of gang-related criminality. Now, having done that cauterization, you then have to go back now to what creates the vulnerability in a situation where most of the perpetrators of homicides and serious crimes in Jamaica are youth, and most of the victims are youth. So we have to focus on the young population, 25, 26, 27% of Jamaica. And in that regard, the re-socializing of the young people in the schools, the educational system, we have to ensure that in the system, there's much greater emphasis on integrity. Teaching the youth what I used to learn at my grandmother's, uh, uh, at my, when I wore short pants, honesty is the best policy, cost what it will. So that set of positive values and behaviors have got to be reintroduced and highlighted in the educational system. Parenting, one of the things that uh, National Integrity Action has, uh, has been doing uh, last year, and we hope to do it this year as well, is to support the National Parenting Commission of Jamaica, to partner with them in 
assisting parents to know how to do the right thing, to develop parenting mentors so that we can get a better input from the parents into the young people. You batter the child, you teach the child, look, the way to get things done when you get bigger is to batter somebody else. That doesn't work. So that re-socializing is very, very important. In this year, for example, the, fo the festival, the national festival, we in NIA, we have sponsored a theme that we go into the, the speech writing, the drama festival, and so on. Integrity, integrity. Do the right thing, shun the wrong thing. So you, you need to get that message out broadly, both amongst the attached youth and the unattached youth. Then there's the issue of the media. Our journalists have got to be better investigators so that we can get a handle on the facilitators, Bob. In Jamaica, as in so many other countries with this level of serious crime, whether you're talking about Colombia, you're talking about Mexico, Colombia as it was, Mexico as it is, when 119 weapons are intercepted on their way from Miami to Montego Bay. Don't believe that it's a 15-year-old gangster in Salt Spring who's paying for that. You have to go upstream. And going upstream means doing the investigative work, and doing the investigative work means that you have to get professionalism in the police force. And in that regard, one of the immediate outstanding areas of agreement, which now has to be implemented, is to make our major organized crime anti-corruption agency into an FBI-type body. Free them from the JCF, make them more autonomous, so that they are better able to go after the big fish. It's good to catch sprats, but if they are big fish facilitating, and if that's an open secret, where the youth in the inner city knows and he sees that law enforcement is only coming after him, that discredits the whole system, undermines trust and confidence in the security forces, and then you're in a worse situation than you were before. So I think tackling the issue of youth re-socialization, dealing with the big fish upstream, as well as managing the state of public emergency in a manner that learns the lessons of the success and the failures of 2010 would be some of the immediate measures that I would suggest are required to begin to cauterize the situation and to tackle the medium and the long-term issues which are more difficult, are more entrenched, and will take a longer period of time. Your recommendations for reform in the justice system um, as well as in the uh, 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 prison community are, are massive. Uh, they're, they're needed, uh, but they go deep, and they are undoubtedly are very costly. Where are these proposals that you've made, and what do you think the process, the progress you will see in the coming months uh, on these solid proposals that you've made? Well, let's talk a little bit about the progress that we have seen recently arising from advocacy by NIA and also ad advocacy by other uh, citizens and organizations of goodwill. For the first time, the Jamaican judiciary will have sentencing guidelines. Like crimes, in like circumstances, must attract like sentences. There's been a lot of public disquiet that this has not been the case, and the lawyers and the uh, legal fraternity will tell you that judge shopping is part of the process here. You try to find a judge who is relatively lenient as against a judge who is uh, more... Uh, so, so we now have sentencing guidelines. We've been advocating that for years. Secondly, we now have judicial conduct guidelines. And the judicial conduct guidelines make it very clear that while judges must be independent, they are also public officers who are accountable. Number nine of that guidelines is accountability. So those judges who are handing down sentences will have to understand that Jamaica is coming to the stage where the United Kingdom reached some years ago. They have a, a body set up to receive public complaints against judges. And the complaints are published online. 
and the results of the investigation are published online. And that body is headed by the Lord Chief Justice and the Lord Chancellor. So we're getting there. On the legislative side, we now have uh, laws long advocated, which will allow us again to get at some of the influence buying. Well known in the United States, well known in mature democracies, where uh, big people give big money and get big results in terms of tax waivers from the uh, either criminal elements or commercial elements who want to buy uh, their way into office while not running for election. So progress has been made. We need to make certain that these steps forward not only remain on paper, but are implemented. And in that context, I think that the diaspora has an extremely important role to play. You are playing a very big role already in areas of philanthropy, basic schools, clinics, and so on. I believe that given the national crisis in Jamaica, our friends, our brothers and sisters in the diaspora need to get more engaged on issues of governance because all of that help that's being given, the impact of it is reduced to the extent that there's corruption in the public sector, there's influence buying in the private sector, and the targets, the most needy people, don't receive it. The question on the money. Jamaica is not short of money. And there are many indicators of that. When um, public, when entities want to go public and they put out um, a call, oversubscription within the shortest possible time. Because the money is here. It's looking for positive things to do. How you get that money into the reform of the governance arrangements and the justice system is a main challenge that we have to face. And that is something that I hope the forthcoming forum sponsored by the private sector of Jamaica, a very commendable initiative, and they should be congratulated, will apply their minds to how to you get some of that money which is in this country into the reform of the governance arrangements. Let us remember, Bob, it is not with any pride that I say this, that the most recent figures which I have seen, Jamaica is among the most unequal income distributed countries in the entire Western Hemisphere. The IMF numbers in 2013 had a second only to Suriname, ahead of the United States in terms of income inequality. Those who have made well and we're not envying them. Those who have done well in Jamaica and have done so by honest means need to make a bigger contribution to our country and to its development. The second source is international development partners. There are partners, the European Union, the British Department for International Development, the USAID, who have been generous in facilitating and assisting in the development of reforms. I know that um, the uh, Canadians in particular have been extremely generous in funding the justice sector reform program since 2008. That's an ongoing program and we appreciate and encourage them to continue. The British and the Europeans are standing by to uh, fund an important innovation, first for the Caribbean, the establishment of an integrity commission in Jamaica. What that body will do is bring together the separate anti-corruption entities and very importantly, give the single body the power to prosecute. That has been the missing link. The Office of the Director of Public Prosecution with the best will in the world, with the best competence in the world, has to deal with 1,000, 1,600, hopefully never 2,000 homicides a year. The prioritization of corruption which is behind a lot of the crime, therefore does not get the attention that it deserves. This body, with a special director of corruption prosecutions, along with an investigative uh, department, will make a difference and will attract funding that's standing by as we speak. And it's going to be a first for Jamaica, a first for the Caribbean, just as our campaign finance reform and our political party registration as well. So, Let's do what we have to do, and I'm confident that the funding will come to support the necessary transformations, because nobody who wishes Jamaica well 
would want us to see more than what we are now seeing. 335 murders in 2017 in St. James, more than eight, the murders in New York City with 8 million plus people.